Tara. Hi, Alethea. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Listen, I've been waiting to do this for a minute. So I'm so glad you're here. And we're, it's going to be short and it's going to be fun. Okay. All right, so let me introduce you. This is my director, Farah Jean-Philippe. She is headquartered in New York City, the big A, the big apple, hey. And she will be directing my play, Renaming Shame at the Broadway Bound Theater Festival. So Farah, tell us, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. So uh, my name is Farah Jean-Philippe and I am a director, but I'm also a playwright and slash producer uh, I actually am the artistic director of Modern Day Griot Theater Company. I've been doing this for quite some time and um, all of the above. I acted and I moved into directing and then I moved into producing and then directing again. So um, I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I think that's about it. I don't know what else to say. Well, that was a lot. Look, you are an accomplished woman and celebrating woman and womanhood mm -hmm. and what that means. And look, I lift you up and I'm so Thank glad to, to share some of you with everybody else. So I'm glad like to be said, shared and I'm glad <laughs> to be a part of this, um, you know, this production. So yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So I have seven little questions. Seven. Seven. Mm. Lucky seven. And okay. I, I just want, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you and you just answer organically. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll have a backup and maybe not, but we'll see how this takes. Okay. Out. I'm game. All right. Good. First thing that came to mind after reading Renaming Shame. Whew. Okay. Um, it was a lot. I mean, what I love about this piece, when I first read it, it was, I had to put it down and pick it back up again. Right. Because it's a lot. What I love about renaming shame, and I'm going to say it that way, it's about, it's not about surviving, right? It's about thriving. And I enjoy how these women get to reclaim their name, um, similar to the lead character. And I love how it wasn't just a sad, morose story about abuse and sexual assault and, and victimization, but it's about really the catharsis that comes from when you find your healing. And, and, and it's not a one day stop, it's over time. And the fact that it is, the story is not linear in, in terms of time, but it jumps from different points and different points of view. I felt that it was, it really told the story in a different way, but a better way in a, in a, in a sense. So it's not like people are watching and waiting for her to come to her healing. They're seeing snippets of who she was in the past, who she was in the future currently, and, and how she manages those two to come to her healing. But I love that it's also an ensemble piece and it's, and it's women that are even the male characters. And I thought that was amazing. Thank you. So your first thought was, whew, I got to put this down. <laughs> Yes, I told I told you I was like I had to read it several times before I could really get into it because it's kind of hard. It's hard because you're thinking about childhood abuse, right? And that's not an easy topic. And on top of it, on top of dealing with childhood abuse, you're also dealing with um, them. You know the 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 issues that women come up with the the you know and how they protect themselves through alcoholism, through bulimia, through eating disorders, um, and then you know, and there's a lack of trust, there's a lack of what have you. And I think the latter scenes where we get to see the abuse itself and how it manifests is also triggering, especially for me. Um, so I thought that that was, you know, that's that, you know, as a victim of sexual assault, I think that that was tough for me to, to really read it and understand it and say, okay, how can I do this in a way that doesn't trigger it's going to trigger people regardless because the content alone is going to do it. But how can we do it in a self-affirming way and an affirming way so that people can walk with their healing Beautiful. or at least with the, with the next steps, you know, if they don't have their healing right then and there. Right. On their journey. On their journey. We're yes. all on a journey. Exactly. Favorite moment in the play. Ooh, I have several. Um, I think for me, one of the favorite parts of it was the office scene, right? Um, when Shay, Shay is telling these young, the other office, her, co her co-workers, her employees about her experiences. And one of the lines that I thought um, was, was the second one when she's like telling these boys that, um, and I don't want to give away the whole thing, but 
she's telling these, this boy off when he's trying to come for her and she's using her tongue to cut him to pieces. And she's like, you should know your mother, you know, your mother taught me, you know? That was, oh, I was like, well, we got to say this right, you know? <laughs> why was that your favorite? Because- Or one of your favorites. The reason why is because even when we, you know, people have a stigma of people who are abused, right? Either you're hiding or you're, you're, you're a shell of yourself. And Shay was still a full woman. And she still knew how to take care of herself and survive, especially in this misogynistic world where men could feel that they could talk to you any type of way and you're supposed to take it. And, and, and she, she took her, she took her own back when she was in her teens. Like she, you know, she was like, oh, okay, if this is how you're going to come for me. Then I'm gonna come for you. And God bless you on your journey. Cause even <laughs> after that, she's like, they never came for me again. And I would neither, because if someone, you know, disrespects me like that, I feel a type of way. So I, I felt that even at that young age, she knew how to take care of herself and protect herself, even when the world didn't protect her the way she should have been protected. All right, good. Okay, your wildest or craziest moment in this play? Ooh, okay. Well, casting is rough because, you know, people take, the, take it on and they think that they can do it, but um, it's a lot emotionally, right? And I think for me, being zoom web all of that and then going into in person that transition is tough and and so with the with the cast trying to get in on it trying to work this through um we had a couple of cast changes you know due to other reasons you know because it happens you know whenever you're in a play and i'm lucky that we had time to actually go through it but then going from the zoom to in person there's a increased amount of intimacy that has to happen in person you could be in your room you could go through the fields you could go through whatever because you're in a safe space now you're with other people and so now there's a le level of vulnerability that you're like oh wait a minute i didn't account for this and so um i was excited to get an intimacy coach you know emily edwards and she uh you know she, she's an intimacy director and she was there to actually walk them through whatever doesn't look a certain way or whatever we needed she was there to actually give that and give some direction and do some choreography because this is really especially the last couple of scenes it's kind of like ah uh, it, it, it kind of leaves you open and vulnerable so it, i'm gonna say that without giving too much away thank you <laughs> thank you okay in this plea who would you say is the and this is a made-up word villainous villain oh I would say, and I, I'm going to say it's two, right? I think it's Uncle Tim um, because he's a family friend. Mm -hmm. And I feel that he takes advantage of both, you know, Jan and her mother, right? Um, and I also think uh, Dr. Colombo. And the reason why is, and let me tell you why I think Dr. Dr. Colombo, because He's supposed to be a psychiatrist to help, but this is just a job, right? And so there's no level of care for his patients and especially their college aged. So he's just like, yeah, you know, it's whatever. So I think that is indicative to a lot of people that need help and they go to someone and it's not helpful. And that, you know, and that's why I think he's a villain, not on purpose. He's not mean, he's not nasty, but he just doesn't care. And Uncle Tim, for obvious reasons. <laughs> so just to be clear, Dr. Colombo is not a pedophile, right? He's not. No, he's not. He's no, he's not, not a he's pedophile. A, he's, a he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a psychiatrist who's supposed to help, um, you know, Leanne and Shay, and he could care less. And, and for me, that lack of empathy um, and, and, and some of that misogyny, it makes him a villain to me. Um, people may what have another- the lines? What are, what are some of the things that he says that just make you feel, oh! Um, my, the worst part for me is, um, you know, uh, he's just a boy. You know, you don't say that to someone who's been abused because she was a baby when she was abused. And you're like, oh, but he, you know, he's just a boy. And you're like, really? Like, right. and what she was she? She was five she, years right? old and he right. was, yeah. And then, a, um, yeah, and, and, he, and he just showed lack of care and lack of empathy. And I think for, um, you know, and the go-ons, right? Go on, 
You know, I'm here to help you compartmentalize this thing. I'm helping you. I'm here to help you do this, but you're not helping. And you don't, you know, you don't listen. You, you, you let them talk, but you don't actively listen. And I think that's a lot of people, they don't go to, you know, to help to professional help for that reason, because mm. they just feel like they're a part of a box. They're not actually um, getting the help that they need. Absolutely, great. But there are some good professionals out there. So I Absolutely. think people should go see them. It's just, I think just like you're trying on shoes, you have to find a professional that's suited to you and you. what your experiences are. Absolutely. Okay, number five. Oh. Most surprising aspect of renaming shame. What surprised you the most? I think for me, we have some, we have male characters who are not, um, who are not pedophiles. In fact, they're, you know, like a Mr. Bill. He's not there. If you read him, you might think he's creepy, but he's just an old man looking for some help, right? And so I like that juxtaposition of even Reverend Gale. He's not you know, he's not a pedophile. He's just there to, to give spiritual he healing and enlightenment. And so a lot of times, and let me tell you why it's surprising to me. A lot of times when people write stories like that, every man is painted with the same brush. They're evil. They're mean. They're, 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 they're the reason why things are happening. So I, what surprised me, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a nice surprise, is that both men, you know, there are two types of men in this piece, right? Um, it's, it's uh, those who are there and they're helpful, they could be supportive and others who are not and who might be the, uh, you know, the perpetrators or the abusers. So that's one. I think another thing is um, I love how the story uplifts women, right? How women uplifting women, but it also shows the contention between women as well, especially women with the same experiences. And so it was great to like delve into what that looks like between two women especially good friends or women who claim to be good friends. Awesome. For number six, we're coming down. We're coming down. Ooh. Okay, you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> been ready. What did you learn about yourself in, in directing this play? Mm, that's a tough one. I learned there were some things I still have yet to process. Mm -hmm. And there were things that I, because I think anyone that sees Renaming Shame will see a, a part of themselves in there. And I, you know, I, in my mind, have, have walked across it. Emotionally, I've walked across it, which mm -hmm. is why I'm a different person. But seeing it manifest, um, it, you know, in different ways amongst the, the women, I was like, wow have I, you know, <laughs> you know, um, have I forgiven? Cause it's all about forgiveness also. And I know I have let it go, but have I forgiven? And that's the question that I have, that I have to ask myself. And I've asked myself and I realized I had forgiven because I was able to let it go because I have, but I didn't actively forgive. Like I didn't see, see someone say, Oh, I forgive you. No, mm -hmm. that didn't happen. Um, but, um, you know, through the work that I've done, I have learned to forgive so that I could move on. Beautiful. It's always a journey. Mm. Always a journey. And the journey yeah. continues. Yes, exactly. Okay. So this is the, this is the last. Drum Why? roll. <laughs> <laughs> Why should people see this play? Oh my God. I think I've said it throughout this whole um, interview. I think this is not a story of survival. It's a story of thriving. It also shows women in different dynamics. Women who suffer from sexual assault or sexual abuse um, at whatever age, we are not a monolith, right? We're not victims. We're not, you know, we're, we're, we're not, you know, we're not blameworthy. I think, and we, and it's not easy to heal, right? Um, and all, and this story shows different women coping different ways and finding their healings for different aspects of it. And I think that there's a secrecy that happens in families where, you know, they either hide it and put it away. And so this can happen for over decades because these women are in three different age groups and you get to see how they come across it and how they dispel the secrets and how they dispel myths. And I think this play 
shows us a happy ending, but not a forced one because it's not an ending that ties up in a little bow. It's like, okay, you're still in the journey. And I think I told you this before. Um, I love Uta Hagen and I love what she says about acting, right? Coming in from the past into the present with the future at stake. And so we're capturing these people in moments of time. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we get, as the audience, I would like to hope that they get to experience the journey and they could resonate with one or two or three of the characters or all of them and they could be a part of that journey for a little while and if god forbid they have suffered from sexual trauma or abuse they know that there's hope on the other side of this there's peace at the other side of it when you acknowledge what's happening and renaming yourself you know don't take the name that was given you um but give yourself a new name give yourself truth give yourself honesty you know so that's awesome. It. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for Miss Farah Jean Philippe, my director. Woo! Thank you. Thank Farah, you. I am so looking forward to what it's now less than two weeks that oh we are premiering. Can you imagine? <laughs> I know. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> less than two weeks for yes. Naming Shame on Broadway Bound. This is a moment that we've been working towards mm -hmm. for months. Yes. And the actors are phenomenal they i think are. the work that they've done we've done it over time and like i said it was kind of difficult because we had to do it in zoom because of the covid restrictions mm -hmm. and now we're doing it in person so that's another level and i cannot wait to see what they turn out they've done an amazing job um as well as our stage manager um emily burston and i think you've done a great job of writing this piece i think you. you you know it's thank stellar you so it's stellar Thank you so very much. Listen, we want to take Renaming Shame onward and upward. But thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time. Thank you for joining me. And listen, people, come out and see us. Yes, come out, yes. come out. This is this is work. This is, you know, I this think- This is theater worth seeing. Yes, it's, it is. It is, it, and it's also seminal work because it, 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 it tackles a lot of like issues that we need to see and we need to, to witness. And if it triggers you, I'm not going to say good, but good because it allows you to see on the other side, what can you do? And so, there is help and people. And there is know, help. There is help through different organizations. And we're going to have, um, I'm going to have that um, information available to everyone. Yes. Who, or someone, you know, needs help, needs support. We're going to provide that as well. And it's yeah. cathartic and it's joyful. So that's it is joyful. Thing. And I think that's what I wanted to leave with, that it's joyful. It's not yes. one of these morose kind of in the no. thing. Mm -mm. There is joy. There's, there's humor joy. in it. Yes. And yes, there's a lot of humor. Unexpected areas, please. Yes, exactly. You And you'll find it because when you sit through it, I think one time we were rehearsing and I, one of the lines and one of the actors did and our stage manager laughed and I looked at her and I was like, oh yeah, that was funny. But I was too busy looking for the nuances and she was looking at it as a, you know, as an audience oh, member and it was yeah. good to see. So yes, you'll oh. love it. Thank you, Farah. Blessing. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Come see the show, everybody. Come, 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 come. Indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.